Excellency, right honorable speaker, <coughs> Madam President, all protocols observed. President Sawyer would like to be here himself, except for the unfortunate incident while on his way to the airport yesterday. He is particularly interested in this engagement because this is all he's done all his life. And when we receive the information regarding this, this, this engagement, he, he was particularly elated. And working with my boss, you know how he is interested in the subject when he calls you after midnight. So Monday morning, when I got a call at 3 o'clock from him to ask me if I've received and if I read a document, I said, yes, sir. Have you done some work? Yes, sir. So he really would like to be here. But, <clears throat> Excellency, before I go into his speech, I only ask permission to bore you with, since we're talking about governance in Africa, to bore you with our frequent experience in Liberia, our current experience in Liberia. On October 10, we'll be going to elections. And uh, as the emerging think tank in Liberia, the Governor's Commission has been seized with advoc advocating peaceful elections. Until recently, when we came to this unfortunate realization that, oh, there is peaceful elections, then there is peaceful transition. And we haven't done a lot of advocacy work or preparation in that direction. So we got to work, developed concepts, and made presentation to Madam President. <clears throat> then she was like, you just thinking about this? It was not uh, a good moment, but we were able to convince her, and she made a submission to the legislature. And if it were possible, I would only ask the honorable speaker to engage his colleagues so they can see reason to pass that transition bill into law. Because for us, this is the first time we are going through a transition in the last 70, for 73 years. The last time we had this, in 1944, it was not the best experience in the world. It actually ended up into a fair coup, and then we have this experience that still haunt us, coming out of conflict, the fear of return to conflict. So we take that seriously. <clears throat> Let me now come to Dr. Sawyer's presentation. Because for us now, the future of governance in Liberia is now. Future of governance for us in Liberia is now. And so we were particularly elated to come here to participate and to present Dr. Sawyer's paper on the imperative for imagining a new future for governance in Africa, challenges and opportunities tossed towards transformational governance. I would like to thank the government and people of Ghana for providing the comfortable and suitable environment for this dialogue. Since independence, Ghana has been a crucible 
for the generation of ideas for political, social, and economic development in Africa. Ghana has also provided leadership in conflict management and resolution in so many instances, especially here in West Africa. Liberians know this too well and remain deeply grateful. Let me also thank the UNDP and International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance for inviting me to participate in this high-level policy dialogue on exploring concepts of governance that can accelerate the development of Africa. I am honored to have been requested to deliver a keynote address. Let me warn you that I do have some notes but I cannot vouch that they are key notes. The importance of dialogues organized to review and rethink governance in Africa cannot be overstated as part of ongoing efforts to address challenges and create, identify, and benefit from new opportunities to improve democratic governance and advance development. I congratulate the organizers for providing a concert note and a thought-provoking think piece to serve as our point of departure as we kick off this dialogue. While there have been many shifts and turns in our conception of governance in Africa over the last 25 years, the consensus still holds that a quality of governance is central to sustaining peace, preventing conflict, and advancing development. I share a view similar to that of the authors of the Think Peace that governance is about the interactions and relationship among institutions and actors in varied environments, situations, and arenas. Institutions are essentially the rules former and informal, which determine that which is mandatory or obligatory, that which is permitted, and that which is prohibited, and about sanction regimes and capacity for enforcement. Patterns of governance interaction determine, define power relationships in a society. And it is true, I believe, that the quality of governance has to do with perception of legitimacy and effectiveness of the relationship among actors and institutions. Legitimacy of governance, institutions, and processes can indeed be measured by levels of trust reposed in them, as Ojoli and colleagues have told us in a think piece. I'm further gratified that a think piece appreciates the complexity of the relationships between formal and informal rules and former and informal actors, all of whom are part of the governance mix, interacting at various levels, from local communities to the international level. Understanding the complexities within various relevant contexts is a never-ending task. This is why our institutions of research and higher learning, our policy think tanks, whose job it is to assist us, assist us deepening our understandings of governance challenges need to be constantly supported. I'm also gratified that in addition to pointing out the complex nature of governance relationships, the Think Peace starting work from UNDP points out that democratic governance fosters a specific type of relationship that are centered on the social contract between state and citizens that should be fulfilled in a manner that is participatory, inclusive, transparent, and accountable. The concept of citizenship is rapidly disappearing from the discourse about the state and the processes of governance and development in Africa. I am pleased to see some reference to it in this discourse. It seems as if the concept of citizenship is gradually being replaced by a concept of stakeholder. 
This thing is not only a matter of semantics. It has been, it has meaning for essential aspects of governance and development. Emphasis on stakeholders can confuse and distort our understanding of ownership of and responsibility for governance institutions and processes and development initiatives and agendas in Africa. Citizens are the only stakeholders who have perpetual responsibility for the development of their country. As we rethink governance for transformation, we need to reintroduce or re-emphasize the concept of citizenship as a different type of stakeholder. When we rethink governance, we have an opportunity to rethink citizenship and situate it properly in our governance and development processes. As we discover the importance of citizenship, we will be able to renew our commitment to equality of citizens, their empowerment with knowledge and skills, and their efficacy as actors. We will discover the importance of place of citizenship, education, and information dissemination in nurturing knowledgeable and efficacious citizens who are the bedrock of all democratic governance processes. This is how we can begin to achieve the breadth and the level of meaningful participation that can sustain systems of democratic governance in Africa. I'm very pleased that the term of meaningful participation has been used in the think piece. Quality of participation is critical to democratic governance that we should support our think tanks and research centers to accelerate the development of a science of citizenship and participation in Africa, such that we can deepen our, our understanding of the various patterns of participation in our various cultures and contexts, and how these patterns of participation can be grounded in democratic values where they appear to be weak in these values. Speaking about deepening our understanding of patterns of participation in African democratic processes, I'm here reminded of our efforts in Liberia to establish institutions for resolving land disputes in some rural areas where chiefs and elders dominated conflict resolution mechanisms on land issues. Female participants in their consultations expressed considerable distrust for the courts and the police as did many of the male elders. When asked for their recommendations, they almost unanimously prefer democratizing the indigenous land conflict resolution mechanism by including women representatives in those mechanisms rather than introducing land courts as we were to be established by the state. Scholars and practitioners in governance often, use, often need to understand these patterns for better than, far better than we do and use them to increase participation and deepen democratic governance. This will contribute to advancing the perception of democratic governance beyond the confines of electoral democracy. But even with the practice of electoral democracy as our focus, we need adaptations appropriate for our social and political context. For example, I'm concerned about how often we apply majoritarian principle without a full appreciation of context and consequences for social cohesion. How we readily give up consensus building and hide behind the legalism of majoritarian principle to deploy winner-take-all democratic solutions that exclude substantial minorities. Or how we fail to apply majoritarian principle when we need instead to transcend narrow sectarian, regional, or ethnic communities and build wider constituencies. Since we in Liberia began our current system of democratic governance in 2006, we have attempted several amendments to our constitution. None has been successful, except one which replaced the majoritarian principle for the election of members of the House of Representatives and the Senate. The rationale for the change was to save money, since almost all elections for members of our legislature ended in runoffs or second rounds due to crowded fees of candidates 
where no single candidate could win 50% of the votes plus one as required under the Constitution without amendment. Now that we have amended the provision and adopted the first part, the post formula do not have runoffs. However, another problem is emerging which will eventually have consequences for social cohesion. Candidates for legislative seats seem to be adapting electoral strategies of mobilizing and holding on to their narrow clan based constituencies. Some candidates are winning by garnering as little as 15% of the votes in crowded fees of candidates. If this trend continues, we could be headed for a crisis of legitimacy of representation in our legislature and our local councils. As we adapt electoral principles and institutions appropriate for sustaining electoral democracy in Africa, we have to remind ourselves that while electoral democracy is a critical component in a system of representative government, it is insufficient for attaining democratic governance. Not even a properly functioning parliament, low level of technical capacity of legislative staff, inability to serve constituency needs, and a culture of corruption are among the challenges that continue to retire parliaments in doing their work as a co-equal branch of government with the executive. Strengthening staff capacity of legislative committees so as to improve technical performance and increasing openness of debate and voting are often identified among the measures which could improve legislative performance. In addition to these and many others, I believe one of the most effective measures to improve legislative performance is to increase the level of meaningful participation by constituencies in discussions about legislative issues and to encourage efficacious engagement of such constituencies with legislators and with local councils and assemblies. <coughs> Excuse me. In some countries, sustaining this level of equality, this level and equality, and quality of engagement between legislators and constituencies might require the support of local people by civil society organizations. Needless to say, this is also a part of strengthening of state society relations. You may notice that I have placed premium on strengthening participation and associational life as an important component of a strategy for democratic transformation. Associational life consists of a social developmental and political activities of a broad range of community-based organizations, professional groupings, youth groups, women's associations, and other such entities which are the building blocks of a vibrant, inclusive, and participatory democracy. Think tanks and local NGOs can be a catalyst in linking them into knowledge sharing and action taking networks as they are situated in governance spaces, such as that they can participate meaningfully at all levels of governance. The downside is that if these, if these groupings are not properly cultivated to promote democratic governance, they can become stumbling blocks instead of building blocks. As a student of governance, I have often felt that despite the high transaction costs, dialogues and consultation which foster the generation of knowledge and dissemination of information about governance challenges amongst groups in society, both vertically and horizontally, are important for nurturing knowledgeable citizens. <clears throat> One of the weaknesses of the democracy project in many African countries is the paucity of the deliberative forums where groups of citizens such as youths, elders, artisans, and the disabled community have the opportunity to discuss together, generate knowledge, and exchange understandings of the various perspectives on these challenges. Understandings exchanged in short forums can be meaningful in assessing group self-interest against self-interest as understood by others. When such exchanges become routinized, trust can be built and sustained. 
in our efforts in Liberia to be a partnership in governance between government and civil society, we at the Governance Commission encourage both government and civil society organizations to agree to increase and institutionalize their consultations. Working with the National Civil Society Council and the Minister of Finance and Development Planning, a partnership policy was formulated and an implementation plan agreed. Among other things, a platform for quarterly sectoral policy dialogues and an annual government CSO summit for policy implementation will be held. We have every hope that this partnership policy agreement will be accepted and implemented by the next government. <clears throat> Let me again say how much I am impressed by the convening of this dialogue to think about a roadmap for transformational governance in Africa and by the fact that it seeks to build upon what related done, already done, appreciate gains already made, and benefit from lessons learned. Allow me to attempt to summarize what I might have been alluding to and articulately saying in this presentation. First, there is a need to elevate the place citizenship in discourse and action about governance and development, recognizing that only knowledgeable, efficacious citizens can sustain democratic governance and create development. In this respect, programs to nurture citizenship through education and empower citizens to become efficacious participants in governance processes and drivers of development must be accelerated by government, civil society, especially think tank and institutional learning, all cooperating together with the support of international partners. Second, in the quest to develop and sustain good governance, attention to deepening meaningful participation of citizens has the potential to accelerate the achievement of many of the other tenets of good governance. Citizen participation can exact accountability, ensure transpar transparency, and encourage greater inclusion. No often not often mentioned is the resilience factor, which citizen participation ensures because it promotes ownership, including ownership of failure. Therefore, more work needs to be done to understand the most importance of participation in various cultures so as to devise strategies for strengthening democratic values and fostering transformational governance through increased participation by citizens. Third, a third area which is inadequately expressed and perhaps largely implied is that social trust can be built through structural and institutional dialogues within the leadership class of society and between leadership class and various segments of society. Deliberative forums on national issues are useful in this respect. The idea is to build trust within the context of reaching a consensus on a development agenda or what might be called strategic development imperatives, even if loosely defined or construed, and a commitment to implement them. Agenda 2063, Agenda 2030, and the more Ibrahim interests of African government provide a head start when adapted within national context. The fourth idea, which is a follow-up on the third, has to do with the importance of developing and deploying the technical and managerial capacity with a proper orientation. One cannot overstate the importance of the orientation of technocrats and bureaucrats. They must buy into the development agenda and have a commitment to implement it. Similarly, the political elite must avoid attempts to induce them into narrow partisan engagements. Finally, there is need for constant and reinforcement of engagement between government and those segments of society whose support is deemed strategically important for ensuring social cohesion, sustaining democratic governance, and traversing the vicissitudes of development. Nevertheless, needless to say, I do recognize that there are important dimensions of the quest for transformational governance which I have not even mentioned. Among these are regional dimensions, are well as a nature of wider international partnership that should be sought. My apologies. 
I'm sure these are areas that will be taken up in subsequent presentations. I thank you for your attention.